Here's a valve amplifier I found inside a cabinet, um, a radio gramophone cabinet, mono one. Uh, this had the point one reference amplifier by Leak, and it also had the TL10 power amplifier, as you see sitting in the back there. We've got the KT61 power tubes, a 6SN7 and EF86 for the preamp side, and you've got a 5Z4G rectifier. Very nice amplifier, we had it all serviced and Clive did a lot of the work here and replaced the capacitors with polypropylene quite often and uh, a lot of resistors were changed and a few valves. We changed the capacitors for polypropylene in many of the cases and some people subjectively don't like that, they think it ruins a high frequency response. Other technicians don't mind it, it seems to be a very subjective thing. Right now we're going to have Phil Master Service Technician take you through the circuit diagram. At a later date, our other technician who did the work on this amplifier will give you an update to the video. Well here we have a Leak TL10. Now you're probably more familiar with the more modern TL12+. Plus. Um, they're very similar amplifiers, <clears throat> but as you can see from this, excuse you, me for the frog in my throat, um, the obvious difference is that this has a number of octal valves in, but on the left hand side there you can see that there is an EF86. The other valves were all replaced in the TL12 and more modern valves. The transformers are of a very similar design, except that primarily that they're black and they don't uh, match the goldish colour of the chassis. Also, you may notice that the voltage adjuster on the mains transformer, that's the larger one on the right hand side, is in a position where it is extremely awkward to get at, either deliberately or otherwise, without taking the screws out and taking the cover off that central section which covers the smoothing capacitor. Um, on the later transformers, there were adjusters on both of them on the top. On the mains transformer, that was obviously for mains voltage, but there was also an output impedance adjustment plug on the output transformer. Very similar style of transformers, though. Um, we have here KT61s as the output valves, and we also have the octal equivalent of an ECC82, the 6SN7 as the double triode which is the phase splitter to drive the output pair. And on the left hand bottom corner we have, as they use later on their amplifiers, we have the octal socket for connecting to the preamplifier. So that's all there is to say about the top of the amplifier. We will now go and have a look underneath it. Right. Here we have the underneath. It's very similar to the TL12 and indeed the TL50. Um, very neat wiring, all in looms, and a single tag board carrying almost all the components. If we look up in the corner here, there's a small resistor across the octal socket and there's another resistor there, for example, and there's a couple more you can't see, I think, because they're in the shadow along the back. The hot smoothing resistor is up here on the transformer, but otherwise the components are kept together. The components would have been generally a pretty high quality. Note that these are not sticky capacitors, these are the nice metal encapsulated ones. Unfortunately, at this age, you can bet that they're all leaking and need replacing. Um, the resistors are mainly 20% tolerance they're fairly indifferent, therefore, carbons. If I was servicing this, I would check the values. Now, depending on the manufacturer, two resistors that look identical, one of them will have drifted horribly high and the other will still be in tolerance. However, here we have two rather different looking beasts. Now, you won't be able to see on the picture because it's very, very vague, but just below the 5% gold band, um, there is a pink band. These are high stabs. The chances are, if you measure the resistance of these two resistors, you will find that they are pretty well bang on still. 
Um, the other reason for using large resistors, it wasn't because of power dissipation, although possibly the dissipation was a little bit more than a quarter watt. It's for low noise, because the cooler they run, the lower the noise that they will generate. Uh, you don't find that quality of resistor in most hi-fi amplifiers, but this is leak and they always were very good. Um, you've got your mains voltage adjuster under here as it's not on the transformer itself. You don't have to move these links on the transformer because they're brought out to screw terminals for you. And to change the output impedance, instead of the plug, you have the wiring up to these tags I'm highlighting at the bottom left-hand corner. And you simply connect it to the two that were appropriate for the impedance of your speaker. It's ultra-linear and you can see the connections here, the two anodes, the two screen grids, and in the middle there is the HT input. This is the smoothing block with whatever it contains, all nicely hidden. Up here we have another electrolytic for decoupling. Um, and that's about it. We'll now have a look at the circuit diagram to the amplifier and see where all those components actually fit in. So here we are, we have the circuit diagram, as is typical of the leak amplifiers, they use the resistor and not a choke for the smoothing. That, I suppose, is the one cheap thing about it. I pointed that wire wound out, you may remember, when we were looking under the chassis. They have used a decent rectifier. Um, a 5Z4 is quite small, but it's adequate for a one channel, and it is indirectly heated. Um, we have a multi-tap mains transformer um, for use internationally. Um, on here, unlike the later amplifiers where they had a separate winding that was for feedback only, here they've taken the feedback from one of the impedance taps on the output. It's a very straightforward circuit, so the circuit come, the signal sorry, comes in on the connector that carries both signal and power for the preamplifier. There's your grid leak, the one meg ohm. There's a grid stopper of 22K. We have the EF86 and it is pentode connected. We have a couple of components here, the capacitor and the series resistor. That is for stability at the high frequency end. As I mentioned in all amplifiers, you do get phase shifts throughout the amplifier, particularly due to leakage inductance in the output transformer. Now, being a, um, a transformer for a leak, it would have been to a high specification, but however high the specification is, there is always some leakage inductance, and that will cause instability. Hence, in the feedback loop, again, we have the usual phase correction capacitor across it. Predictably, the feedback goes back to a resistor in series with the bias resistor for the input valve. Interestingly, we have another phase correction capacitor across this resistor here. This suggests to me that they had not insignificant problems with instability at high frequency in this amplifier. The feedback in the TL12 is simpler than in this amplifier. It doesn't have that, if I remember rightly. And the strong suggestion must be that they managed to improve the quality of the output transformer. We have yet another little compensating capacitor here where the um, decoupling for the screen grid, instead of going either straight to ground or straight to the cathode, They've used the potential divider here to feed the screen grid to stabilize the voltage. Now, because this valve um, draws a constant current, plus or minus the signal modulation, it is surprising that they needed to do that. You normally only get the use of a potential divider in valves where the current changes. For instance, in radios, automatic gain control or automatic volume control, whichever you prefer to use, um, varies the current in the IF amplifier and or the frequency changer. And there it is more usual to stabilize the screen grid voltage. I'm surprised there's a potential divider there, but anyway, they've stabilized the voltage there. 
Not surprisingly, the anode feeds the grid on one side of the phase splitter. Um, in this phase splitter, both valves are involved. I have mentioned this circuit before. That's the bias resistor. This is a much larger value of resistor. Basically, whatever happens on this side, if the current increases, the voltage on the cathode would increase. The increasing voltage there is the same as applying a greater negative voltage on this control grid, which is held for AC purposes steady by decoupling it. So you have a constant DC bias there. So as the current goes up there, it's a seesaw, the current goes down there. So the voltage falls there and the voltage rises for a positive input. And the opposite is true if you reverse the polarity. Hence the phase splitting action driving the output valves. Um, there's very little to say about that other than yet again they have found the need to have some phase correction or stabilizing in these two capacitors across the grid leak. The output valves rather naughtily share a single bias resistor and capacitor. I've said this before, I will probably have to say it again. It is bad practice to have shared um, bias components for an output valve. It's fine in a driver stage where it helps to balance the circuit. But in an output stage, if the valves are not very well matched, um, there will be an imbalance of current. An imbalance in current through the output transformer is the same as passing a DC current through it. This reduces the inductance and it also causes increased distortion and particularly at the low frequency end. And again, any imbalance caused by not balancing the current in the output valves means that it will clip on one side before the other. And there is no means in this amplifier of dynamically balancing the output. Um, they are imperfections, but having said that, this was probably for the time it was made a very good amplifier indeed, and it was probably very reliable. Um, plenty of decoupling you'll notice. Um, resistor, electrolytic, and then a big resistor and another electrolytic to decouple the input stage. And then in the preamp where it is taken off from there, the main HT, there will be plenty more decoupling. But we'll come to the preamp next. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook and Twitter accounts. So far to date we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players. We've also covered the Mullard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers, the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70 and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.